it's not written in scriptures because where is it written in the Bible that Our Lady ascended up body and soul? Because even the angels didn't understand entirely. If you're imagining things, it shouldn't, it's not right. Since we weren't there, and since it's not something that someone took a picture yeah. or took a video of Our Lady going up to heaven. That even a little kid. He, he got up and he said, no, that's something that's wrong. That's against what God says. No, Our Lady died and then after a year they found her body. The church governed tyrannically. If Our Lady died or not, God doesn't have, he's not in a hurry. How do we meditate on the rosary? We, we who are miserable sinners, you translated to our language, to our 21st century language, what the saints used to call contemplation meditation was just this. You mentioned that Our Lady was the paradise of God. God used all of his imagination. Yes. Yeah. Saint Therese of Avila said it was the crazy one of the house. How could somebody be so absurd as to uh, say something so With stupid? Into that doubt. I, exactly. Once I got an email with the list of all the dogmas that the church had proclaimed. To be a Catholic, I am obliged to buy her all of this. We can just know, we can just open up little doors as if to say, to know something about her. That's actually a proof that um, Mary had such an important role in the church. Right from the beginning of the church. Exactly. Salve Maria. Welcome once again to Mary Our Queen, the podcast of the Sleeves of Our Lady. Today having, we have the great pleasure of having with us Reverend Father Michael. It's a great joy to be here, Brother John, Brother Nimish. And Brother Nimish is here for the first time. I'm sure many of you know him. He has his Catholic Comebacks uh, short series on our channel. But uh, it's the first time he's joining us here for the podcast. And uh, Father Michael, let me tell you that you're always with us. You're always organizing the podcast. But to have you here personally is going to be a joy. It is a joy for us. And I'm sure it's a very big joy. For all those who are watching us, because finally they, <laughs> they can hear no, you talk. It's a, it's a wonderful joy to be here and to be able to uh, be with everyone that's going to be uh, taking advantage of this podcast. And since we're uh, at the fe Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady, it's a special joy because mm -hmm. Our Lady, when her Assumption, she went up to heaven, body and soul, but in this assumption, she also brings us all up closer to God and closer to her in heaven. Yeah, because for the fact of the assumption, we just did a novena on the assumption, yes. of course. But then I'm sure you agree with me, Father, that the assumption is a theme we never, we, the Mariam Num Komsuatis, we did never have enough of Our Lady, but especially of this theme of her assumption, because it is one of the pinnacles of her glory on this earth when she went up to heaven was, I guess, the maximum that she, glorification that she received on this earth. One of the rewards yeah. that she received for her perfection, because in order not to have any corruption, God didn't want her body to have any corruption at all. He wanted her in the perfection of her body because it corresponded to the perfection of her soul. Uh, there's even a prophecy about our Lord that he would not be corrupt in anything in the body. Mm -hmm. The same he wanted for Our Lady. <laughs> Why? Because she's so perfect. She's the paradise of God, as St. Louis de Montfort mm -hmm. says. And so everything in her had to be perfect. And it's like the culmination, the perfection, the reward is that at the end of her life, she didn't have any possibility of any type of corruption. And so she went up body and soul into heaven. She was crowned there as queen of heaven and earth. But in this assumption, uh, she went up by the power of her glorious body. Yeah. Because as soon as uh, Pius XII, Pope, he doesn't mention in his proclamation of the dogma of the assumption of Our Lady, if Our Lady died or not. Yeah. But even though most saints, they say that Our Lady did die, mm -hmm. but it was a death without any suffering. And there was a separation between the body and soul, which uh, which death means that, in which Our Lady was, was separated her body and soul, but that immediately they came together again, but as her body became glorious because it was already in the beatific vision, the vision of God. And she went up to heaven, body and soul, Many times we say 
paintings that the angels are, are taking her up and whatnot. But actually, the angels followed her up. They, they were the, the, the court, as if to say, of Our Lady going up to heaven, and the whole Blessed Trinity crowned her. I heaven. guess, Father, I'm sure the angels did accompany Our Lady, didn't they? Because even if they didn't have to carry her up, yes, because they wanted to be with her. Yeah, if we are so happy, we who are miserable sinners are so happy to be slaves of Our Lady. Imagine the joy of the angels, because they themselves are slaves of Our Lady. She is the queen of angels. The so the angels consider her as their queen and themselves as slaves of her to reach God, not just like we do. So. Yeah, well, imagine St. Gabriel. St. Gabriel is considered by many to be the guardian angel of Our Lady. And he was there at the Annunciation. He was there on many occasions. How many other angels were always wanted to be next to Our Lady? But, I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something uh, very special. And even that phrase of the, of the scriptures, Que esista, who is this who arises like... The dawn is Our Lady, because even the angels didn't understand entirely all of the glory of Our Lady, all of the wonders of Our Lady. And they were not only curious, but they were anxious to see Our Lady coming up to them, body and soul, in heaven. Because they could be with Our Lady here on this earth. Yeah, of course. But it's not be. the same thing. <laughs> just, yeah. for, just like for us, mm -hmm. if Our Lady comes down, or the angels come down to us, we're going to be so joyful. Yeah. But when we're uh, up with them in heaven, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, mm -hmm. that's going to be something much more wonderful because that's the special place where, where the sons, the children of God and the angels, or children of God in it also, in it, uh, are going to be for all eternity. So that's something very special. But it was a process. Yeah. Our Lady was conceived, she was born, grew in graces, in sanctity at every moment, but it ended, her, light, her earthly existence ended with this assumption that we, uh, that we celebrate now. Okay. It's something that. marvelous. Father, you you mentioned that Our Lady was a paradise of God. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis de Montfort. Yes. Uh, would, uh, maybe, does this have anything to do with Our Lady going to, into paradise? And uh, I don't know. Uh, it's funny. Well, I, I, <laughs> I think it does very much. Because, it's like, because imagine, God is pure spirit in his essence. But the second person of the Holy Trinity mm -hmm. wanted to become man. And he became man through Our Lady, because Our Lady was created in the most absolute perfection that God wanted to give to a pure creature. And even some saints, they say that, St. Louis de Montfort says that Our Lady, as if to say, uh, used all of his imagination, if, if one could say this. God used all of his imagination. Yes, yeah. in creating Our Lady in the perfection of Our Lady. And that's why she's the paradise of God. Because God, being pure spirit, uh, he doesn't need a, a paradise that's filled with trees or, <laughs> or yeah. beautiful things, but he sees the perfection of the soul. And Our Lady has every perfection. Humility, uh, generosity. I mean, we could go... Yeah. All the virtues, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, everything. Exactly. Yeah. So, but there's a certain importance of the presence. There's a certain presence when the person goes to heaven that they didn't have before. Yeah. So when Our Lady went up to heaven in body and soul, this paradise came closer to God. In Our Lady also, of course... We, one knows that in heaven, there are, are as, it, as if to say, two paradises. One is the vision of God, which is the most important. It's purely spiritual. Yeah. And it's going to fill our souls as it filled Our Lady's soul with pure 
pure happiness. The beatific vision. Beatific vision. Yeah. But also there's a paradise for the body. Yeah. So our Lord Jesus Christ is there with body and soul as well. But Our Lady and all those who go to heaven at the end of time, at the end of, when the bodies are resurrected, are going to go up to heaven in body and soul. And each one receives their paradise. So Our Lady is the paradise of God, but she also receives the paradise. So He's giving to her a total joy also for the body and a reward for her soul <laughs> in perfection. Because here on this earth, even though she was conceived without original sin, she didn't have at all moments the beatific vision. Because yeah. otherwise there wouldn't be a trial for her. A trial for her. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it's very, uh, very much linked together. The paradise that Our Lady received, that we all receive, yeah. and the paradise of God that she is. Well then, Father, so like you said, the the assumption of Our Lady is something extremely important in all the senses that we've been talking about till now. And in fact, we know historically that it's a feast which the early Catholics used to celebrate. It's mm -hmm. one of the oldest devotions in relation to Our Lady, the assumption of Our Lady into heaven. Why was it that this dogma was proclaimed by the church so late? It would make sense for, since we Catholics, Christians are celebrating it right from the beginning of the church, why did the church wait so many centuries for it to be proclaimed so late, so to speak? Why do you think yeah, so? This is uh, an objection which keeps coming up. No? Yes. Yeah. The church invented the, something new. Uh, yeah, exactly. Many all, times people all. think that a dogma is something that the church decided then decided and then. that it was like that, but that there is really not a basis in scriptures or at least it's not written in scriptures because where is it written in the Bible that Our Lady ascended up body and soul? But That's what's very important to to see is that everything that's in dogma is in reality based on scriptures yeah. and on tradition, of course, because tradition, it's not that uh, the Bible also came out of nothing. The Bible was also yeah. tradition. Jesus didn't write any book. Jesus didn't write the Bible. Who wrote the Bible? The, the, some of the apostles. Uh, evangelists. They were decades later. Uh, exactly. And and they also knew the reality. They If they were not apostles, they had direct contact with the, the apostles. They knew what the apostles said, and then they would tell that to the next generations. And so the fathers of the church and whatnot. But not everything that is known is already proclaimed as a dogma. Why does the church sometimes proclaim and sometimes not proclaim. They wait for the uh, the the church is something very supernatural but very also very organic. Mm -hmm. So as time passes by, many truths of the church, many truths of the scriptures are already known and it's put into daily life. But no one thinks about proclaiming a dogma about that. Yeah. Why? Because it's May, many times it's not necessary yeah. because everyone already knows th that it's that was that it was like that because of tradition because they knew the apostles what the apostles had told their disciples so everyone knew the the tradition but it wasn't written in scriptures but people would talk about it people would write about it write letters one to the other but they didn't see the necessity of proclaiming the dogma. And the church is very, very uh, careful also. So one thing is also that it's careful. But many times it just wasn't necessary. Yeah. So as time goes by, many times it becomes necessary. For example, the proclamation of the dogma that Our Lady is the Mother of God or that Our Lord Jesus Christ is true God and true man. Everyone knew it. Yeah. It was already already ingrained in all of the... Yeah, in fact, these dogmas that you mentioned were only proclaimed when they were contested. Yes. Many only times when it's there was like a, that. Only when there was a heresy which denied that, 
were well, people found it. How could somebody be so absurd as to uh, say something so With stupid? Into uh, doubt. Exactly. Uh, the uh, maternity everything of that God. Everyone already knew. Yeah. Right. I don't know if you remember the case, Father. Uh, that there was a council. They, the they people started. Some a few people contested. A heretic contested. Our Lady was not the Mother of God, and the Council of Ephesus, and the bishops came together to decide to to. Uh, decide the question once and for all because mm -hmm. the church always believed that Our Lady was a mother of God yes. and there was a heretic who contested this now at this moment the population the Christian population at the time got so indignant that this question had been raised that somebody had gone to the extent of actually doubting whether Our Lady was a mother of God or not that the Christians they surrounded the, the church where the discussion was going on and they threatened with violence the council, unless they put they, things in order, they would I mean, proclaim <laughs> exactly. the truth. They proclaim the truth. Yeah, of course, the council was going to do that. Yeah, but the people could not accept that something, and they demanded that dogma be done formally, so that once and for all the question would be decided. Nobody would dare to raise this question again. But then, it's what you were saying. The everyone believed in it. Only when somebody was evil enough to go against this truth, that they found it necessary to, to. Proclaim it. Exactly. And, and so many times it's like that. A dogma is proclaimed when there's something uh, attacking yeah. what would later be this dogma, this truth of the faith that everyone holds as being uh, evidently truth, yeah. evidently the truth, or through tradition or through scripture. But also many times it can happen that there is a question of some people saying that it that it happened or some people that it didn't. Now, the case with the Assumption of Our Lady basically was given as a truth. Most people understood that it was a truth of the faith. And in the 20th century, Pius XII uh, deemed uh, there was a lot of uh, pressure also from many bishops that wanted this truth to be proclaimed dogma. But they perceived that it, the time had come. Hmm. I, it, it's not so much that there was a lot of uh, opposition. Uh, opposition, but in our day and age, there was there were a lot of ideas uh, that the Catholic faith was maybe uh, getting old, that it wasn't uh, necessary, the devotion to Our Lady was not as strong as it should be. And so this dogma was proclaimed to support the devotion to Our Lady, oh, to to give m much more strength also to a certain faith that the people had in Our Lady, in our, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was proclaimed because many people it, thought it was overdue, <laughs> that the time had come. And that's what we've seen a lot. Many of the dogmas, many of the things in scriptures, first, of course, and it was our, what Our Lady wanted also, the devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ became stronger and stronger and stronger. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ came to the world through Our Lady. He wanted the devotion to Our Lady. But this devotion came a little bit later because it was necessary for the foundations of the church to be very strong yeah. because otherwise maybe the devotion to Our Lady might be understood as even there were some people, it seems, in the beginning of the church that thought that she was the fourth person of the Blessed Trinity. <laughs> that was... Yes. Uh, uh, that's actually a proof that... Um, Mary had such an important role in the church right, that we even yeah. that if things go so and far. According to saying, according and according to Blessed uh, and Catherine Emmerich, she says that the devotion to Our Lady started with the apostles. It had to be, and they had a special uh, union with Our Lady that uh, prefigured the devotion that Saint Louis de Montfort talks about: the sacred slavery to Our Lady. So they were slaves of Our Lady. That's what it, one can deduce from this. He, he does, she doesn't say it word for word, but it's something that one can imagine that our Lord Jesus Christ wanted to exist throughout the history of the church. And 
also that Our Lady, being so humble, didn't want it to uh, diminish in any way the devotion to our, our Lord Jesus Christ. For example, the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It didn't yeah. come to the church as we know it now right. until yeah, exactly. much, much later in the history of the church. Why? Because God doesn't have, he's not in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. And these things need time also for the grandeur of the church, the grandeur of the devotion to Our Lady. And some saints arrive at the conclusion that devotion to Our Lady will only be understood entirely as it should be on this earth when the world ends. So little by little, we dogmas more and more, yeah. about Our Lord, about Our Lady will be coming up in the church, even though they existed yeah. In reality, from it, the beginning. It would be, I guess, an explicitation of what we already believe. Exactly. What we already Entirely. It reminds me, Father, I, once, uh, many years back, I received a list on the computer. I got an email with the list of all the dogmas that the church had proclaimed. And marvelous. it was uh, a long list. <laughs> and I sent it to somebody who was not in the Herald, somebody from my family, I sent it to the person. And she wrote back, what, oh my God, uh, to be a Catholic, I'm obliged to buy her all of this. <laughs> no, try, why do you try reading it? And the person read it and realized that even though she had never heard, she had never seen the list before, she believed in each and every one of them. And that's what being a Catholic is. Exactly, because everything in the, That sense, not the uh -huh. Catholic common sense. Yeah. Exactly, because everything in Catholic doctrine, uh, Tertullian said that the human soul is naturally Christian. Or in a, in a Christian at that time, not Catholic, of yeah. course. And... That means that everything in the Catholic Church, one might think that it's complicated or, or whatnot, but in reality it's very simple because it's natural and supernatural. There's a supernatural grace given to every baptized person in order to believe in all of this. Of course, there's certain uh, details that are studied that one might not know, but in Gen in its generality, yeah. everyone in reality believes all of these things. In fact, that's what St. Louis says in the uh, True Devotion. I'm not here trying to prove these truths to people who are proud. Because there are people who will never be convinced. You can have an evidence before you and the person would still not be convinced mm -hmm. of the truth. These are for simple and humble souls who are willing to be touched by the truth. And he starts teaching about Our Lady. And in fact, it's like you said, Father, when a true Catholic reads it, you know it's true. The same teaching that, and that has the taste of it's, truth. It's called uh, just as uh, common sense exists, whereby we know what is what and what is not. Uh, a Catholic sense. Yeah. Everyone has a Catholic sense given by God, supported and aided by Our Lady, by their guardian angel, and by the desire to be faithful to the Catholic faith. Uh, to God and to Our Lady. And that's what we see in all of these wonderful Catholic dogmas. Just yesterday, Father, I was speaking to an, a little boy, 10-year-old, uh, and uh, I asked him, why do you think, why do the heralds uh, preach about Our Lady so much? You know, why, why do we give so much emphasis on Our Lady and not other things? And I said, yeah, because if you have, he told me, yeah, because if you have Our Lady, it makes sense. Because if you have Our Lady, everything else falls into place because you you can't continue sinning. This little boy, I said, oh, how do you know that? Who taught you this? He said, well, Catholic common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Very, that's wonderful. It's yeah, spectacular. It's one of, yeah it's, uh, so it's impressive, you know, the, this, yeah, even a, a little kid, just because but of his That's innocence. Yeah. Innocence. Uh, blessed... Uh, Hofhauser, when he was, uh, Hofbauer, sorry. Blessed Clement Hofbauer, when he was a little child, in one, one case, one of his teachers was teaching something about religion, and he went off into a heresy. And blessed, blessed Clement, he was a young boy. Uh, he, he got up and he said, no, that's something that's wrong. That's against what God says. That's what against what uh, Our Lady says. 
against the church. And then they got into a discussion, this little boy with the, with the professor, and everyone started to realize that what the professor was saying was wrong. Now, they were all children, and then when they went to the priest, the priest said no. They showed how it was wrong. How did he as a little child know this? How does he that how did he know? It's the Catholic sense. So when we talk about Our Lady going up body and soul into heaven, imagine if we were to say, No, Our Lady died, and then after a year they found her body. No one no, no one would say no one would believe it. I feel it would bad be just by imagining just, that you, feel you can't wrong. even imagine yeah, exactly. that. Exactly. If, Something that it's absurd to imagine. All of this that we've been talking about till now applies to all Catholics. I mean, in that Catholic sense, like you said, we know, we feel in our, we feel in us bones, so to speak, that our leave went up to heaven, that it would be a, an anti-climax for her to have lived a wonderful life on this earth and then just died like any one of us. It wouldn't make sense, of course. But as slaves of Our Lady Father, is there something special that this dogma says to us, the assumption of Our Lady? As for all slaves of Our Lady, because this podcast is for all Catholics, but especially for the slaves of Our Lady. What does this dogma mean to us as slaves more than other things? Well, I think that everything that a slave of Our Lady uh, strives for is summed up by the union with Our Lady. A slave of Our Lady doesn't want anything more than to be entirely united to Our Lady to love Our Lady, and not only to participate in what she had on this earth, but to participate with the, her in heaven, <laughs> with her glory, with her conviviality, her convivium, her relate to be in rela con continuous relationship with her, to be conversing with her, talking with her, to be with her, with the angels that are around her, to know everything about her, and to know that she was assumed yeah. body and soul into heaven is also something that we can relate to, not only relate to, but we can know that we will probably, if we're faithful to this devotion, we also will be with our bodies and souls in heaven. First of all, a slave of Our Lady is happy for everything that, in, that glorifies that glorifies Our Lady, yeah. everything that makes Our Lady happy, everything that makes her uh, filled with love. But also, we will we know that we're going to also be up there with her. <laughs> we're going to be in her mm, together with her. We're going to feel her gaze. We're going to see her gaze. We'll listen to her voice. And we also will be with our bodies and our souls in heaven for all eternity yeah. with her. Imagine that, Father. The day will come and we can physically kiss Our Lady's feet, be hugged mm. by her. Oh my God, that. <laughs> It'll be yeah. something that I don't think it's very easy to imagine. But it, I think it does very much good for our souls. Mm -hmm. Just to imagine that. Just imagine, this is what St. Ignatius would say in his, in his retreat, spiritual retreats, uh, spiritual exercises. He says that we should imagine, our imagination should help us hmm. on the path to heaven. So we can imagine, So since we weren't there, and since it's not something that someone took a picture yeah. or took a video of Our Lady going up to heaven, in that sense, it's kind yeah. of a pity. But in another sense, each one can imagine it in the most elevated way. Yeah. We can f we can imagine ourselves watching Our Lady with the angels singing and going up to heaven. And of course, the slaves of Our Lady have a special place in the heart, in her heart. Yes. As St. Louis says, we are separated members of her. So it's like we are we went up together with her since we are part of her. Exactly. When God took her up to heaven and when she went up to heaven. And we don't have to think about time because yeah. for God there's no time. So everything that happened in the past, as soon as we 
are linked to Our Lady as slaves of love, then we automatically participate in everything that happened already with Our Lady. Oh. That is happening with Our Lady. And that's happening now. Exactly. Spectacular. And, and it, one can only imagine on the day of the Assumption, for example, what type of ceremonies God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all the angels do in remembrance of this assumption of Our Lady. And we participate in the graces here on, the, uh, on earth when we, when we participate, for example, in the, in the solemnity, in the mass, but also just by participating with our love, with our, with our imagination, with our prayers, with what we ask Our Lady and, and, and this occasion. Because it's good that you said this, Father, because many people, I, I see in the comments at least, mm -hmm. they ask, how do we meditate on the rosary? Is it okay to imagine? Is it, they think that maybe some people may have a problem. Oh, is it imagining things that shouldn't, it's not right. I don't, but it's good that you... The thing is, our imagination is a part of ourselves that yeah. God gave to us. And just like anything else, it has its reason. It has its a final end. Why? What's it for? What is our imagination for? Uh, of course, Saint Therese of Avila. She said it was the, the was mad the, woman of the house. Yeah, yeah, the crazy, the crazy one of the house. As long as it's not well used, because if if we don't know how to use our imagination, yeah. it can bring us. Uh, it it can take us on tremendous yeah. journeys off the path that we should be going on. And it makes us distracted many times. It, but if we know how to use it, we know how to put it, or we, we exercise our imagination in good things. For example, we can imagine ourselves in a conversation with Our Lady now. And Our Lady, oh, but it's not real. Mm, but it can be yeah. real. A prayer. If we use... If we use our Catholic sense, we know how Our Lady might possibly treat us. And we start to talk to her. Of course, these imaginations start to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. If they're put in, in the place that they need to be placed. So our imagination can help us very, very much. Also, Father, I guess all of us sense feel this in ourselves us and everyone who's watching us that you can't just turn imagination off either we're taking it to the to do something good with it or it's going to take us towards the bad but then it's not something that no I'm afraid of my imagination so I, it doesn't work like it I can't just turn a switch and it, now it's off mm. I, I the only way for me not to go to sin is to use it to go to heaven exactly I, there's no third path for me to exactly but since our imagination just like our passions our our very difficult, they're imponderable. Yeah. One cannot touch our imagination. It's easy to see how we can use our fingers. For example, you, uh, our fingers are governed tyrannically. Yeah. If I say, close my hand, it closes. Yeah. Open my hand, it opens. But our imagination has to be guided with a certain amount of capacity that it's not so tyrannical. We have to be careful. Just like the passions, St. Thomas Aquinas says that our passions have to be governed with diplomacy. <laughs> we have to know how to govern our passions, and we have to give in on secondary things in order to, in the most important things, govern our passions. Our imagination, we have to have a certain amount of expertise in govern, governing our imagination. We have to give to our imagination agreeable things, good things that we know that are going to do good for our souls. So in the Assumption of Our Lady, it's something that since we haven't seen it, like we said, yeah. we have to use our imagination. And the more we put marvelous things in it, the closer to reality we're going to arrive because heaven is much more marvelous than we can even imagine. Hmm. And since we're used to a a day-to-day -day 
that many times is very gray. Yeah. Uh, it's there's nothing very special about our day-to-day life many times mm-hmm. it's hard to imagine these such marvelous things but we should try to make an effort to do this imagine the angels imagine God the Father God the Son this ceremony it's something that will help very much our 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 spiritual life I guess this is what he just said now father this is what we call imagination is what the Catholic Church calls meditation you translated to our language to our 21st century language what the saints used to call contemplation meditation was just this to imagine in uh, in a concrete way and the also, higher realities and also what happens in, of course in the imagination we start to uh, create a an ambience but many times in the meditation as well things start to come to us we start to perceive things that we didn't perceive and our lady inspires us <laughs> to grow and to understand more about these mysteries of the faith and that this starts to grow within us and we start we we feel it we start to understand it And it's all because of a grace. Oh. Why? Because our, our Lady loves us and she wants to give us graces to uh, have more convivium with her. Thank you, Father. This is really blessed. Unfortunately, um, the time is up. But If we I'm can sure. imagine yeah. a, a, a time imagine without it. time, <laughs> of course, imagination has its limits. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, at least me for one, I have, I've got... I receive many graces especially I'm sure next time I'm going to pray the fourth glorious mystery the assumption of our lady it's going to be much better I have many more elements for me to meditate better to imagine the scene better and I really hope that all those who are watching us watching this podcast have also received similar graces to be able to meditate better to enter more profoundly and uh, meditate better basically on the grace of the assumption so thank you once again Father Michael it's been a real pleasure Your for both of us And I congratulate Brother John and all the wonderful work and all the podcasts that he's been doing. Brother Nimish, it's our first time on the podcast, but he's been helping out a lot behind the scenes. Yes. So I want everyone to pray for this, uh, this podcast, that it grow, all the slaves of Our Lady, but that we all grow in our knowledge of, uh, of Our Lady, in our love for Our Lady, and that we our consecration be each time more supported with uh, with all of these wonderful things that as, as brother John said in the beginning de Maria nunca satis <laughs> of Mary we can never know enough because uh, yeah if yeah. God if, if she's the paradise of God yeah, exactly we can just know we can just open up little doors as if to say to know something about her. Because everything that we say is not enough. Yeah. It's not enough. Father, can you give us your final blessing now? Of course. The Lord be with you. And with your yes. spirit. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon all of you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Salve Maria to everyone. Salve Maria. Salve Maria.